Um, so uh, some of you may recall, uh, if you attended uh, in October, we had an event related to extremism that was a collaboration between JFS and the Anti-Defamation League. We had a couple of staff members talk about uh, sort of rising extremist movements with an eye on the impending election, which was only a few days away. And we really wanted to present kind of a bookend event um, that will cover related but not the same material um, after the election. So here we are a month after an election that many people, I think in our community and others, feared would uh, prompt or result in um, extremist violence. And um, I'm really pleased that we're joined today by Kate Bitts. Um, you may have read in the email, she is the uh, Spokane-based program manager for the Western States Center an organization that fights white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and other forms of extremism in eight Western states, including right here in Washington state. And today, Kate is going to talk, among other things, about how keeping our community safe from hate is something we all need to be involved in and how we can do that. And she'll also talk a bit about uh, the events of the past summer um, from the perspective of Western State Center and their work. So without further ado, pleased to present my friend, Kate Bitts. Hi, Neil. It's really nice to see everyone's faces. I, I wish we could all be together, but at least we're together on the internet. So um, just to give a little bit of background on Western States Center and on myself, um, our website is here. Uh, the center is an about 30 year old progressive organization that provides a lot of training, strategy assistance, research, uh, all that good stuff for communities around the Pacific and mountain states. Um, our core region is Idaho and every state that touches Idaho. Uh, and our home base as an organization is in Portland, which has definitely given a, a front row seat to a lot of the issues that have been rising over the last four or five years. Um, as for myself, I originally started at the center as a senior fellow in our Defending Democracy program, which is a program that I now help to administer and ended up joining the staff uh, last August full time. So um, my role is essentially assisting communities with organizing against hate groups, helping out with both uh, responses to issues as they come up and also uh, helping folks think about some proactive ways to make a difference. Um, I'm going to keep things pretty informal today, uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to hearing all your questions and just spending a little time with everyone. Um, to kind of address the, the issue of potential election related violence, which we did a ton of work around and, and we're so glad to have the ADL uh, on top of that whole issue as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see what has and hasn't happened in that time during the lead up to the election and then after the election. Um, what I think we're seeing a lot of at the moment is actually a denial phase on the far right. Um, this is in some ways comforting to see uh, that very little has happened, that the so-called Million MAGA March, which did have a lot of participation of white nationalists and hate groups, was a lot smaller than expected. Um, and that mostly these Stop the Steal events, as they've been called, are, are really dominated at this point by professional agitators and conspiracy theorists rather than a broad chunk of, uh, of the conservative base who I personally was quite worried would get um, sucked in by some of these things. Um, I also have to say that I think it's been very effective, some of the organizing that went on before the election um, pushing elected officials to make statements about election integrity. Uh, we also push law enforcement agencies to make statements about what voter intimidation is and to indicate that that would be pursued to the fullest extent of the law. All of that readiness has results. And um, I think one of the things to really keep in mind is that um, 
as community organizers, we're not necessarily in the prediction game. <laughs> what we're doing is trying to influence results. Um, and I do believe that voter intimidation was not as widespread as many feared it would be because a lot of proactive steps were taken, um, not necessarily because there were no plans for it in advance. We know that there were some plans in advance to be monitoring ballot boxes and engaging in other forms of, of voter intimidation. And part of the reason why that likely didn't happen was because it was reported on and pursued by authorities. Uh, one of my favorite indicators of this was actually, um, did anyone see the state by state fact sheets on voter intimidation that were put out by Georgetown Law and the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection? They did a great state by state wrap up on this and I'll have to grab that and put it in the chat for you. Um, a three percenter umbrella organization uh, for those who don't know, three percenters are like loosely organized um, paramilitary groups. Uh, and all of these umbrella organizations tend to constantly be in a little bit of conflict with each other about who is the most authentic patriot and things like that. Anyway, one of these umbrella groups um, put out a statement rescinding a stand down order that they had issued for their members. So saying, yes, you should be out and about around the election. However, they also linked to the Georgetown law fact sheet and said, this is what voter intimidation is. Definitely don't do that because it's illegal. So when you've even got the far right linking to materials on what not to do in order to stay on the right side of the law, that's usually a pretty good indicator that your message is permeating everywhere and that people really do feel that, um, that there's a lot of pressure on them to act appropriately in the moment. Um, I, I do have to pat everyone on the back a little bit for all of those efforts in the, in the lead up to the election. Um, yeah, and I, I think that leads into probably what is my main point today, which is that um, it's incredibly important in this time and especially um, especially when we're not dealing with uh, an overt and urgent crisis. Uh, it's, it's really on each of us as community members to take a look at, uh, at what we can all do to make a difference. So I wanted to give a quick shout out to some of the work that people are doing here in Spokane, some of which I've been more involved with, some of which I've been less involved with, uh, because we are a region that does see a lot of hate activity. It's been that way for a long time, and we don't really have reasons to, um, to think that that won't continue into the future. Um, so one example of how it is incredibly important for people to take responsibility for the climate in our own communities uh, and, and think about what we can do. Uh, when I take a look back over the past couple of years, I definitely think of all of the organizing that went into getting Matt Shea to not have another run for state legislature. Um, and members of the Jewish community in the Spokane area have played so many key roles in, in that, that um, I struggle to sum it up. But uh, one, of, one of the proudest moments, I think, was getting a group that included Neil and might include someone else on this call, I'm not sure, to put out an op-ed which addressed his history of pushing discriminatory narratives, um, flirting with anti-Semitic tropes and even linking to a website that um, appeared to blame Israel for 9-11, uh, really bringing out for our entire community how this is a pattern, uh, how dangerous this is to have an elected official engaging in this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I, I think really getting some results in terms of people understanding that what an elected official links to on their social media is not just a matter of someone being rude or crazy on Facebook. It's a matter of what kind of standards we're setting for our community and what kind of narratives we're putting out there into the world from a platform of power that a state legislator does have. Um, of course, after the anti-hate campaign is before the anti-hate campaign when it comes to elected officials in the fourth district. Um, I do have to point out that two really strong Shea allies did get elected. Um, one got reelected, one is newly in the state legislature. Um, 
And this is something that we're going to have to continue monitoring, dealing with, and, uh, and building power in the fourth to challenge that type of, of inappropriate behavior and discriminatory ideology. Um, for another example, I would really like to point to what people in the neighborhood of West Central, where both Neil and I are based, are doing to deal with this rash of neo-Nazi flyers that have been out and about in the neighborhoods, and um, which I know many of you have probably received communication about from Temple Beth Shalom. Um, these flyers are being circulated by a very small group of people, and because they are so inflammatory, Personally, I see them more as an act of intimidation against marginalized people than as a uh, good faith attempt to recruit people into this essentially skinhead gang. Um, no one's going to take a look at a flyer that is, that is really displaying Nazi symbolism or almost nobody's going to look at something like that and say, hmm, I need to call their hotline, tell me more. Uh, I believe this is really more about letting people who would be targeted by this group know that they are around and they are active in our neighborhood. So it is very unsettling. Um, a group came together around the uh, West Central Development Group, which works on asset-based asset community development in the neighborhood um, and is usually really focused on the bread and butter issues that we do have in, in this uh, neighborhood that has a lot of poverty and other issues. Um, but they realize that this really intersects with a lot of problems that we see in West Central. If young people are seeing this type of propaganda, you know, they, they may be um, vulnerable to recruitment. Uh, if young people of color see this on their parents' cars, they're definitely going to think, what kind of a neighborhood is this? Am I really safe and welcome here? Uh, and, and really question their role as community members. I think that's equally true of Jewish folks who live in West Central. So it was really important for everyone to put together a virtual rally that was held a couple months ago. Um, there was an ad that was printed in the Inlander uh, showing that the neighborhood uh, stands for inclusion. And actually there was an insert in utility bills as well addressing that this is the problem. And uh, that was sent out to every person in West Central. So whoever was opening up their Vista bill that month uh, actually got to see uh, this statement of inclusion, which probably reached some people who may not have otherwise seen something like that in the Inlander or on the internet. So meeting people where they're at is really important. It's not something that's necessarily going to stop that activity. This group has continued to be out and about um, doing, doing their nonsense, uh, but it does create more of a neighborhood feeling and give everyone the, the chance to think through what can I do to make a difference? And if I'm feeling unsafe, what are some places and institutions that have signed onto this inclusion statement? So where could I go for help if I needed it? Um, all of that is really meaningful. And I think we're heading into a period now where it's going to be very easy to sit back and imagine that um, with a new federal government coming in that has signaled that they are going to be taking far right extremism and white supremacy seriously, it would be very easy to say, oh, okay, well now the FBI is on it, right? Uh, now, now our government is going to kick in and do all of this work for us. And as community members, we, uh, we can, take a back seat, um, the state is going to handle it. This is something that I'm very skeptical of for a couple of reasons. And one is that um, extremist activities do not always overlap with what is considered a crime. Of these flyers are actually a perfect example. I had members of the City Human Rights Commission hitting me up saying, shouldn't this be prosecuted as a hate crime? And from my heart, I would say maybe yes right? We know that this is an intimidating gesture. We know this is an incredibly nasty thing to put out in a very diverse neighborhood like West Central. However, uh, having read through the Washington State hate crime statutes, I can definitely tell you if this is not being put specifically on an individual's porch in order to intimidate that person as an individual, you can't prosecute a hate crime against an entire neighborhood. 
and rewriting the law to make that possible would really run into some potential First Amendment issues that we might not like in our own political activities. So because not every problem that we see in our community is actually a law enforcement matter, uh, this is where it's incredibly important for us to stay aware, be talking to our friends, reach out and forge friendships and relationships with people in other communities and figure out what is going on. How do people feel living in Spokane? What would maybe help them feel safer? Um, are there policies, for example, that we can set in schools? Uh, is there an opening for Spokane to create an office of civil rights that can track these things even if they are not actually a matter for, um, for law enforcement investigation? How do we all come together to make our community a safer place? Uh, and that can be as simple as being a good neighbor uh, rather than assuming that, that federal agencies are going to take care of all of these things for us. Um, one thing that I hope we've all learned in this really difficult time with the pandemic is that there are ways that we can build each other up, protect each other and check in on each other as, as neighbors and as fellow Spokenites that are really things that, um, that no official body can achieve in the way that we can do that for each other. So a lot of my work with the center is around taking care of those same sorts of issues as it relates to hate and extremism. Thank you very much, Kate. I, I appreciate uh, kind of getting the overview of, um, of the center's work here and of your work here specifically. Um, I'm wondering if this would be a good time to uh, invite any questions people may have about any of what you've talked about or related issues. Would, would this be a good moment for that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, I think, you know, we have a, a, not an enormous crowd today, so why don't we let folks unmute and ask, and if it turns cacophonous, we can go back to using the chat, but I <laughs> always like to hear people's voices if I can, so. For sure. Go for it. Mary, would, yep, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for that presentation. You, you're so well-spoken. We really appreciate it. Um, the, the examples you gave, like in West Central, is all about intimidation. Uh, what I'm wondering about is, you know, we've heard on a national level about QAnon. Is that something that's that we're hearing about in our area, um, locally, or anything like that? Um, yeah, and I think in two ways. Um, so one way is that there are certainly QAnon believers who live in our community. Um, so personally, I, I definitely uh, walk around and drive around with an eye for what kind of stickers do people have on their cars, what sort of graffiti is popping up um, on the streets. And uh, I've, I've certainly seen some QAnon symbolism and messaging showing up around the area. Um, does That's, everyone know what QAnon is? Before? Yeah, let me see if I can find a good explanation of this. Actually, I can I can link you one. So QAnon is basically a conspiracy theory that posits that um, I guess you might say broadly like elites, government, um, entertainment, and financial elites are all involved in a conspiracy to harm children. Um, in some ways that are pretty um, described in a pretty Baroque way, I guess you might say. So, you know, giant conspiracies flying children around for the purpose of abusing them, um, massive secret basements and, and things like this where children are supposedly being held. This obviously doesn't really have a basis in reality, but some of you are probably already thinking about how it mirrors conspiracy theories that have targeted Jewish people and communities for a very long time. Um, and there's a good article that I will try and find you here um, relating to how this recycles things like blood libel, even if these groups aren't explicitly talking about this as some kind of quote unquote Jewish conspiracy. Um, they are often positing that Jewish individuals like George Soros are involved in it, if that makes sense. 
So I guess that would be my very quick uh, QAnon overview. Um, so, I mean, yes, there are some people in our community who are putting all of this out there, um, you know, using different code words and things like this. Um, the other thing that has unfortunately happened during the time of the pandemic is that um, in part due to the fact that social media companies were understanding how truly dangerous these QAnon ideas are. Um, and here's that link. Um, they started to suppress their hashtags, make it harder to post these types of things online. Um, and that caused QAnon believers to, um, to rebrand a little bit. So can I just get a show of hands who had heard of QAnon? Okay, who's heard of Save the Children? Hashtag Save the Children. So there were actually events based around this hashtag in our community this summer. And what a lot of people who, um, who actually attended it or shared content about this didn't realize was that Save the Children was a hashtag set up as a alternate hashtag for QAnon believers to spread the same conspiracy content in a way that would appear to be less extreme. Um, which is very unsettling. For me, the second that I'm starting to see this, you know, in the wild, in my own social media feeds and things like that, that's when I start to get really concerned. Um, and I actually put together a discussion with a few people who do a lot of serious work against sexual violence in our community. And we're starting to repost some of these Save the Children memes, not even realizing where they came from. Um, and was able to do some education around that uh, and, and you know, changed some minds, which was great. Uh, but this, this is definitely something to watch out for. And it's very difficult when a conspiracy theory group like QAnon is intentionally trying to obscure the roots of where these beliefs come from so that people who would see something that says QAnon right on it would say, well, that's ridiculous. I don't believe in that. Well, if it looks like a more um, generic campaign about child safety and preventing human trafficking, more people will go along with it. Um, Lutheran Community Services actually did a whole social media post series that didn't address this head on, uh, probably because they didn't want the comments to fill up with, with conspiracy theories. Um, but they did address like, here is the truth about child trafficking. Here's the truth about human trafficking. Here's how you can help um, in order to take people in a direction that was more constructive and based in the realities of, of these very real problems rather than in the conspiracy. So there's my, my QAnon answer. Thank you, very thorough. Um, does anyone else have a question top of mind that they'd like to ask? Okay, well, I, I actually wanted to know uh, something and, and if it's all right, I'll, I'll ask you that now. Um, what is a thing that, that in your opinion, many people outside of the the work you do, many people who aren't, you know, focusing so much of their time and attention on hate and extremism. What is one thing people misunderstand about sort of the general topic of, of hate and extremism? Mm, that's such a good question. It's okay if you need a minute, but yeah, let me let me think about that. I mean, I think one thing that a lot of people um, don't necessarily understand from the beginning is um, is the relationship between structural issues of discrimination um, and hate groups. So for example, I think a lot of people were extremely shocked by the rise of the alt-right around 2014 to 2016 uh, because it seemed like all of this was just coming out of nowhere. That was a really common sentiment that I heard around the time of um, Unite the Right in Charlottesville and things like this. People just did not understand where were all of these young people coming from 
who appeared to be really, you know, highly invested in white nationalism uh, and even neo-Nazi beliefs, right? Um, why were why are people willing to kill for this? Where where did it all come from? Did it like did it come out of nowhere? Maybe you know David Bowie died in 2016, and uh, and that just sent the world spinning in a different direction. Like it just appeared to be something that didn't have any context to it. Um, but the fact is that these groups had been organizing for a very long time online in spaces that most people, you know, understandably didn't did not understand or realize that this was happening. Um, and the other thing is that uh, because of the, the reality of structural white supremacy uh, and, and really the, the long history of, um, of accepting discrimination in our communities, um, there was fertile ground for all of these extremists to work with. Um, so for example, if young white men grow up thinking that they are more entitled to um, a living wage job, a college education, a scholarship, um, a loving female partner than other people, then that really creates the space for, for resentment to grow. And that's exactly what these extremist groups um, unfortunately exploit. Uh, creating a fairer society overall is good for a lot of reasons, but one reason is that if we all have a better understanding of where we sit structurally, uh, then it takes away that fertile ground for resentment. Um, if, if there are more opportunities for young people in our societies to go to college without accruing a ton of debt or become homeowners, um, that means that they are more invested in, uh, in our society and everything is going to work better. Uh, if, we, if we don't fix some of those structural problems, I think we are going to continue seeing all of this hate and extremism. And they're not things that you can really separate out from each other. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I particularly appreciate sort of um, reframing problems from focusing on individuals' actions to larger societal issues that are connected with those, because I think that's, it's a natural human impulse to want to look at the smaller, simpler uh, problem and not see all of the, the linkages to other things. Right. I guess if you think about it, it's like what I do is, um, if you imagine this whole problem as being a really bad backache, um, what I'm most involved in right now is being the aspirin that you can take and just quickly like get rid of the symptom. Um, but uh, fixing structural injustice is like getting up and doing yoga every morning uh, and will actually fix your back. <laughs> right, the root causes, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed. So um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the summer and uh, sort of events I would imagine leading up to the election. Um. Yeah, for sure. Um, this summer was unprecedented in so many ways um, and uh, they would be really hard to all talk about at once. But I think one of the things that we saw here in Spokane was certainly um, the fact that paramilitary groups, uh, not all of whom are like overtly white nationalist, but all of whom are pretty invested in, uh, in far right narratives and beliefs, started showing up on the streets and saying that they were trying to protect businesses from protesters. Um, this was something that was obviously happening all around the Northwest, but especially in the inland Northwest, we saw a lot of this activity. Um, and that also kind of grew out of these reopen rallies that were happening, right? So we have really seen the far right locally flexing its muscle in terms of getting into the habit of being active. Um, and uh, I think as all of us know who've ever organized with any type of community group, uh, that's a way of building capacity and getting ready for the next thing, whatever that might be. Um, so we definitely saw a lot of that happening. A lot of that was, um, was accompanied with rumors going around that uh, the racial justice protests of the summer were all being arranged somewhere else. 
uh, put together by maybe people in Portland or something like this. I don't know how many of you saw things going around about like buses or flights coming to Spokane or from Spokane to Coeur d'Alene, which were allegedly filled with rioters. Um, all of this was obviously pretty nonsensical, right? But it did get people activated. Um, and that was, that was one worrisome development for sure, uh, leading up to the election. I also think that really prepared the ground for some of these um, beliefs and claims that are coming up around the idea that the election was not legitimate. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm watching really closely right now is really how many people are going along with these ideas and what might that motivate them to do in the future. Um, now that election day is thankfully over, one of the big dates that we are looking at right now um, is inauguration day because people right now might be clinging to that last little bit of hope that their preferred candidate won. Um, and inauguration day is going to be a big wake up call for some of those folks. And the question is then do they accept um, what is happening or do some people choose to lash out? That's kind of the big question that we're all thinking through. Yeah, Rosalind, I think, I think that's essentially exactly the, the thing, right? <laughs> and in terms of, of trying to predict activity, that's incredibly difficult in part because a lot of the worst and most deadly extremist activity that we have seen over the past four years does not come from the type of organized group that's easy to monitor. It comes from individuals who um, have gone through, in some cases, some really rapid radicalization processes online um, and where nobody really knew what they were going to go out and do until they did it. Um, if you take a look, for example, at the online activity of someone like the Tree of Life shooter in Pittsburgh, it was very typical of just anyone who would be popping off and saying horrible things online until it wasn't anymore and those thoughts turned into action. There are many, many people who make those exact same type of threats, those exact same type of statements and never leave the couch. Um, and that's what makes this work incredibly difficult at this moment and uh, what makes upcoming dangers really hard to predict. Right, right. I, I think that one, one uh, not a caveat, but a, a, an addendum to the question about, you know, what dates might be coming up that, uh, that could result in um, extremist activity is how can we know? And I think you're addressing part of what also at our October event, um, Vegas Tunnel talked about the mm -hmm. extremism expert, which is there's a limited, there's a limited extent to which we can know, even if we're totally. experts, even if we follow it closely. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are there are also dates that just have way more relevance on the the extremist calendar, so to speak, than than they do on ours. Um, I mean, April nineteenth, April twentieth, being a perfect example of uh, something that is associated in patriot movements with um, Paul Revere's ride, in neo Nazi movements with Adolf Hitler's birthday. Uh, of course, this was this was around when the Columbine school shooting happened. It's also when uh, Timothy McVeigh committed the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, which of course is no guarantee that anything will happen any April, um, but it is always something where I can feel myself getting a little nervous leading up to that date, right? Any, any comments or questions from, from any of the folks here uh, at this point? I wanna make sure we uh, let people kind of chime in if they would like to. Okay. Well, oh, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm wondering if you know of any elected officials in Spokane mm -hmm. and Coeur d'Alene that may have ties to extremist groups. I hear names every once in a while. I don't recall them right now. Yeah, there are. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the easiest ways to map this out in Eastern Washington is taking a look at the Matt Shea report from last year. Um, 
And uh, when we talk about ties to extre extremist groups in terms of our elected officials in this region, what we're typically looking at is not like overtly neo-Nazi groups or white nationalist groups. It is more of the paramilitary extremism uh, that calls itself the Patriot Movement, right? So in terms of who tends to show up for things like um, the so-called church at Planned Parenthood events or who uh, go up to Marble Country for, for their 4th of July event, uh, you know, I think we have to look at our, at our fourth district uh, state legislators. Um, uh, Bob McCaslin Jr., you know, was a strong Shea ally. Uh, never spoke out against anything that he did. Uh, Josh Kearns on the county commission, I always have questions about him because he also was just very quiet around that entire issue. Heather Scott, I think, too. Right? Yes, Heather Scott in North Idaho was wrapped up in a lot of the planning around the Malheur standoff um, and, you know, has, has appeared with Confederate flags at events and things like this. That's really not ideal. Yeah, Rob Chase is definitely like on on my list of, of oh my goodness, who's going to be doing and saying what in the upcoming legislative session. Um, Chase has written a pro QAnon blog post um, <laughs> on the same site where you can find a lovely profile of me as someone who's supposedly pushing Agenda 21 on the people of Eastern Washington. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's he's jumped on every possible conspiracy theory from 5G being somehow harmful to, um, you know, agitating to attempt to uh, prevent transgender people from using the bathroom that's most appropriate for them. Uh, Chase is kind of a, you know, if you imagine extremism as a buffet, he, he stops at a lot of those options and puts a little something on his plate. <laughs> So yeah, we, we all need to keep a really close eye on him going forward. This actually leads me to something else I was wondering, and I don't know, you know, what, what your take on it is, but are there things about extremism, especially as someone who grew up here, right? You, mm -hmm. you grew up in this area. Um, are there things about extremism in the Pacific Northwest or even just in the Inland Northwest that are distinctive, that are different in significant ways from where, or from, sorry, from how extremist movements manifest in other parts of the country? Are there things that are uniquely, mm -hmm. you know, us for, you know, not, not for better, I guess, for worse? Um, sort of. So I think a lot of, of trends and tendencies in extremism have become a lot more nationalized and even internationalized than they used to be. Um, and that does kind of mean that we are not necessarily the type of epicenter that we were before, just because there's a lot of activity all over. However, that doesn't mean that, uh, I guess what's maybe unique about us is you can probably find every type of far right extremist active somewhere in the Northwest. Um, I also think that they have a slightly shorter pipeline into the mainstream here than in, in many other regions. Um, what we were just discussing with local elected officials is one example of that, right? That certain conspiracy or far right beliefs are just not a barrier to holding power in this region. Um, and that really opens the door for, for a lot of worrisome things. Dave, I can see you had somewhat of a question in the chat. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. Are you talking about the thin blue line flag? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a blue stripe. It looks like it's black and white flag with black and white stripes, but there's a blue in the middle of the stripes. And then in the usual corner of a US flag, it has the 50 stars. So this flag is um, intended to support law enforcement. Oh, um, oh the it's, thin it's, blue line, okay. <laughs> line is, uh, is a reference to the thin blue line and, and the role that law enforcement is seen to be playing in our community. Um, white for the uniform? Uh, 
the cars? I think black and white just because. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this flag is actually a really good example of how some narratives have moved from the, the margins into the mainstream uh, in the recent past. And there are even police departments that display the thin blue line flag um, at their buildings or even on their police cars. Uh, what concerns me about this is that that flag was originally intended as a rebuke to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, oh. And black and white, all lives matter. Whoops. I lost my. <laughs> wow, rude. Muted by the host. <laughs> um, I think um, this is this is really hard to address the Blue Lives Matter flag because a lot of people don't think of it as being anti-Black Lives Matter or being racist or discriminatory in any way because it's framed as a positive way of supporting law enforcement. Um, and this makes discussions about it incredibly difficult because it's hard to impute any particular motive to people who are displaying it. Um, however, it did not come from a positive uh, vantage point. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that has been mainstreamed very rapidly um, and could probably use some pushback. But at this point, this pushback would have to be very careful and like very based in talking to people who you have a good relationship with and saying, um, look, do you know where this came from? Right, as opposed to um, I saw this on a house. Let's go protest or something. You know, we have to be much more cautious about it because a lot of people don't know much about it, really. Bill, I see your question in the chat. Oh, Bill's question, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that this is something that our current school board is getting pretty engaged around. Um, and that would actually be a good place to do some outreach and, uh, and ask what's being done. Um, it also is like a constant worry that bringing certain things up, uh, even to criticize them, <laughs> can take students in that negative direction, right? Um, and it's something that always needs to be happened with nuance. There is there is no one size fits all solution to some of these issues. Um, we do also have at the center a toolkit for schools. Uh, we have not done a training specifically on that for Spokane Public Schools, um, but one of my current fellows that I'm supervising is working on that a little bit. And uh, we have done uh, a bunch of trainings late this year for, for educators on handling extremism in schools. The second part of Bill's question uh, or, or a comment, I guess, added on was that there's, he has the concern that perhaps mm -hmm. discuss, discussing these issues could point students to sites that they might not otherwise know about. I don't know if that's, if that's something that is a concern for uh, organizations like yours in putting together curricula? I would say it's something that always needs to be taken into account. Like that is a real worry. Uh, but we also have to think about the environment that students are currently in, uh, especially with remote learning and a lot of kids spending a lot more time on the internet. Um, this is an environment that's been intentionally shaped by far right extremists for recruiting. Um, in fact, uh, neo-Nazi groups were very early adopters of, of early technologies like message boards. Um, Stormfront probably being the most, uh, the most notorious of those. So um, for those who, who do have young people in your lives who you talk to often, I guess what I would say about that is don't assume that your kid hasn't already been exposed to a lot more of these narratives than you ever were as a child. Um, they're everywhere. Uh, extremists intentionally use things like uh, multiplayer gaming websites and things like this to talk to kids and push their narratives. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should just, you know, unplug the router and, and 
get your kid off the internet entirely. This is where a lot of positive social interaction happens for young people as well. Um, but you know, it's, it's important to be proactive. Like Mary is saying, uh, we can't shy away from bringing these things up with kids. And in fact, it can be really important to be in that influential position of being the person who says, look, this is some of what you are going to encounter in your life online. Um, you know, here's why this isn't true. Here's what these folks are trying to convince you of and the type of action that they want you to take out of it. And like, that is bad. <laughs> you know, uh, keeping those open lines of communication is, is so important. And um, I don't know, I mean, it's, I can't say that it was particularly easy growing up in this area during the time of the Aryan nations. Uh, I certainly learned very, very early about some of these movements. Um, what I also learned from, you know, opening up the Spokesman Review and reading Bill Moreland's pieces about the Aryan nations uh, and seeing pictures of little kids in, in Nazi uniforms who were my age was how serious of a problem this is. Um, and that probably did help to put me on a path where I spend a lot of time trying to improve and, and protect our communities from this type of thing. So, you know, awareness is not all bad. What a harrowing thing to be exposed to as a child, though. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I probably have that experience in common with a lot of people on this call, right? You know, learning early that, that uh, there are those folks out there who target our communities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, I'm wondering at this point, we're uh, certainly not at the end of the hour, but um, we're moving in that direction. Um, anyone else want to uh, want to comment or, or add a question uh, to the mix? Okay. Um, well, Kate, do you think there's anything that uh, that you haven't touched on that you you want to add? Hmm. So one conversation that I keep having uh, in terms of just outreach to, to other communities and talking with organizers is this sense that um, people were very prepared for the election and prepared for potentially really bad things to happen around that time and are now feeling almost a little bit silly about um, the fact that we've been very lucky so far. Uh, and some people are really wondering what to do in terms of our activist lives in a time that's a little bit quieter, you know? Uh, we've all gotten used to, I think, the adrenaline and the urgency of constantly responding to things. Um, and maybe we don't really know what to do when that feeling is dissipating a little bit. Uh, my suggestion for what to do is to go back and, uh, you know, study, um, think about proactive ways to, to fight structural discrimination too. You know, really ask yourself what, what changes could be made to create more just and inclusive democracy. Um, and, and rest, like it's, it's okay to take this time for reflection and, uh, and just to realize that we've had incredibly stressful and difficult time the past five years or so, maybe six. Um, and uh, yeah, and just just understand that capacity building is something that's always important, you know. Rosalind? <laughs> um, I live in Michigan. Oh, nice. Yes, and uh, <laughs> a whole lot of stress. I don't need to go into the details about our governor almost being kidnapped and murdered. Yeah. Um, by extremist groups. Um, but what I wanted to say in response to what you just said um, is that um, it is very clear from the 70 plus million, I think it's up to 74 million, um, who voted for Trump, mm -hmm. um, that the kinds of things that we um, hope don't happen are still there, mm -hmm. uh, the structural uh, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-immigration, anti-LGBTQ, and on and on. Um, and uh, I 
uh, belong to a synagogue in the Detroit area that has as a major project um, something called an organization called uh, Detroit Jews for Justice. Mm -hmm. And we've actually been talking about this very thing recently in terms of um, relaxing a bit, but not too much and not too long, because there are so many issues in Detroit proper, which we deal with in terms of food insecurity and lack of water and all kinds of things going on in, in Detroit um, that, uh, that we, um, we don't plan to rest anytime soon. And going forward, that's one of the reasons I asked the question about what to expect mm -hmm. uh, perhaps after December 14th, uh, after January 5th, um, uh, one of the Republican candidates is a QAnon person, mm. we know, right. And inauguration day, yep. when it will become really clear that there's no turning back. Um, but the, the, what I call the evil forces that uh, are not in keeping with the values and the missions we may hold are still at bay and are still there and will continue to be there. And so um, we will be fortunate in having a president and vice president and an extraordinary cabinet uh, if the Senate approves, um, that will uh, go a long way to reverse, hopefully, some of the ills that we've seen in the last four years, but not all. Yep, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And um, I should definitely put my email address in the chat, but uh, we're currently seeing a lot of communities uh, deal with the fact that they're that they now have conspiracy believers in office or who came quite close to ending up in office yeah. uh, and are are just starting to put together some some strategies that uh, that people can use to uh, to counter that so that hopefully other places don't end up with uh, 10 years of that nonsense as we did in the fourth year right yeah. yeah. Shirley, yeah, I see you've unmuted there. Uh, what, what would you like to add? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, we all want to know how we could help. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been working extensively with the Democratic Party in Spokane. And a project that we are going to undertake come once Georgia thing is over. Right now we're writing postcards to, um, to Georgia. Telling voters, please go out and vote for the good candidates who we who we support, is to look at Spokane, look at the precincts that really are red, and you can spot them. I mean, you can really pick them out, and then actually um, start a postcard writing campaign that goes on all the time, yeah. letting people know what they're supporting. Because I don't think they know. I think there's a lot of ignorance. They see a name like Rob Chase and say, oh, Rob Chase, that's very familiar. He was a treasurer. I mean, he's a well-known name. I'll just vote for him. Well, if they know what this man really stands for, maybe they'll think twice about it. And so I think we just have to be continuous and not just wait till a month before elections to work on confronting the ignorance that is very present in our own community. And I feel in a little way we can do something. And so this is a little, little something that we're hoping to do. Yeah, I, I think that sounds really promising. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I work for a 501c3 and I'm on the clock. So <laughs> my answer might seem a little roundabout on that, but um, I'd encourage you to also look at deep canvassing models, um, which I know um, our friends at United Vision for Idaho uh, did a lot of work actually texting voters and uh, using some really well thought out scripts from people's action to, uh, to talk about some of those issues on a deeper level than you're able to, you know, if you're just knocking doors with really clear electoral goals coming up. So yeah. Nice work on that for sure. Well, Kate, I want to just really thank you for your time today and um, for the energy and passion that you put into the work you're doing. I think that uh, 
you know, our community, the Jewish community has been um, among the most sort of on guard in the last years about the potential for, um, for threats. And even now uh, there's more concern than there was uh, even a few months ago about no, nothing specific, but the general, uh, the general danger that, that could be out there. So thank you for what you do. And I want to thank everyone who attended. I know that the last few months we've had some relatively heavy <laughs> topics. And I think that that probably reflects the realities that have been going on, but we'll, we'll try to kind of, you know, mix it up in the, the winter months to come, as Kate says, uh, there has to be some rest as well, a balance. So, but I really appreciate uh, your time today.